comes from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 37, verses 18 through 22 and 26 through 27. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they'd recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes, what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traitors. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. Here ends tonight's reading. Give me your tickets right now. I'm gonna kick your meek little sheep butt. Ow! Cut it out, Gideon! Bad, bad. What are you gonna do, cry? Hey! You heard her. Cut it out. Nice costume, loser. What crazy world are you living in where you think a bunny could be a cop? Kindly return my friend's tickets. Come and get them. But watch out, because I'm a fox. And like you said in your dumb little stage play, us predators used to eat prey, and that killer instinct's still in our dinner. Uh, I'm pretty much sure it's pronounced DNA. Don't tell me what I know, Travis. You don't scare me, Gideon. <gasps> Scared now? Look at her nose twitch. She is scared. Cry, little baby bunny. Cry. Ah, <gasps> oh, you don't know when to quit, do you? <gasps> I want you to remember this moment. The next time you think you will ever be anything more than just a stupid carrot farming dumb bunny. <laughs> Bad. Are you okay, Judy? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Here you go. Oh! Wow! You got our tickets! You're awesome, Judy. Yeah! That Gideon Gray doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, he was right about one thing. I don't know when to quit. Hello, 8th grade. It is good to see you here tonight. That movie is, or that clip is from the movie Zootopia. How many of you have seen that movie before? Quite a few of you, right? It's a really great movie. For those of you who haven't, I highly recommend it. Awesome movie. Uh, so poor Judy tries to stick up for her friends, and Gideon responds in a way that is completely uncalled for. So Judy was wronged by Gideon. How many of you have been wronged by someone before? Quite a few of you. Probably most of us at some point in our lives have either been hurt or disappointed by someone else. So what do you do when that happens? How do you move on? Well, tonight we're going to start our O Brother series by talking about forgiveness and restoration and taking a deeper dive into the story of Joseph. So the story of Joseph is told in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. It's a longer story in the Bible, but it is well worth the read. Joseph lived a crazy life full of ups and downs, and he was seriously wronged a few times in his life. I'll summarize it for you now, but I'm going to give you the PG version. So if you want the PG 13 version, you're going to have to read it for yourselves in your Bible. Okay? It's Genesis chapters 37 through 50. So Joseph comes from a large family. In fact, he has 10 older brothers. And Joseph's brothers hate him for three main reasons. One, Joseph was their dad Jacob's favorite. And Jacob didn't hide it very well. In fact, he gave Joseph this colorful robe to wear as almost even like a, a way to have him stand out for his favoritism, right? That's not a great parenting move. If you ever become a parent one day and show favoritism to your kids, just know it causes a lot of problems, right? So Joseph's brothers were jealous of him because he was their dad's favorite. Second, Joseph was a bit of a tattletale. And if you have siblings, you know that doesn't exactly increase like sibling affection, right? If you get tattled on all the time. So his siblings didn't like him for that reason. And then third, Joseph had dreams some of the time where his whole family and his brothers would actually bow down to him. And then Joseph told his brothers about these dreams. So as you can imagine, how many of you have siblings here? Yeah, would you be kind of annoyed with Joseph if he was your sibling? 
Yeah, I would be too, right? So Joseph's brothers were just angry with him, and they planned on retaliating in a way that was once again completely uncalled for. So most of his brothers wanted to kill him, but Reuben, one of the brothers, convinced them to throw him into an empty well instead. And jo- Reuben secretly planned to rescue Joseph later, but he didn't get a chance to because some Ishmaelite traders came by, and the rest of the brothers thought it sounded like a good plan to just sell Joseph into slavery instead. So he was sold for 20 pieces of silver, and um, Joseph was just sold just like that. And then they took his robe, dipped it in goat's blood, and gave it to their dad so he would think he would be killed by a wild animal. Like, what? That is insane. It sounds like a crazy Netflix TV show, right? But his uh, story gets even more intense. So Joseph shows up in Egypt and is sold to a man named Potiphar. And the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. So anything that Joseph did, he succeeded in. And Potiphar recognized this. So he quickly put Joseph in charge of everything that he had. And Joseph and Potiphar did very well. Until he, Joseph was accused of something he didn't actually do, and he was wrongfully thrown into prison. So things once again looked pretty bleak and hopeless, but God never left Joseph's side. And pretty soon, Joseph became the favorite of the prison warden and was put in charge of the whole prison. And around the prison, Joseph gained the reputation of being able to interpret dreams with God's help. And then one day, the pharaoh of Egypt was having some dreams that kept troubling in him. And someone told him about Joseph in this prison. And so he brought Joseph before him and then asked him if he could interpret his dreams with God's help. And God actually did use Joseph in this way. So Joseph tells Pharaoh that there are going to be seven years of prosperity in Egypt, like seven years of great crops, of economic boom. Like it's going to be an amazing seven years for Egypt. But then those seven years are going to be quickly followed by another seven years of complete famine, of nothing. There will be nothing to eat. Everything will go very poorly and the nation will be in trouble. So Joseph tells Pharaoh that while they go through the times of prosperity to store some food away to get Egypt through the time of famine. So Pharaoh then decides that Joseph is the man with the plan and puts Joseph to, appoints Joseph to be this man to get them through these next 14 years. And that is like a complete Cinderella story for Joseph because he suddenly becomes the most powerful man in Egypt. He is just the only person more powerful before him is Pharaoh himself. So like a couple hours ago, he was in prison and now all of a sudden he's second in command of all of Egypt. It's a crazy rags to riches story. So the years of prosperity come for Egypt and everything is going so well that they actually stop keeping records of the food that they're storing away because there's so much of it. So Joseph and Egypt are just really well off. But then all of a sudden the years of famine hit and Joseph and Egypt are prepared but other neighboring nations aren't doing so well. So pretty soon people start traveling into Egypt to get more food. And then, sure enough, Joseph's ten brothers who sold him into slavery show up and come before Joseph and ask for food. But they don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them immediately. And he's like, all right, my brothers, I miss you so much, I forgive you, let's be a happy family. No, just kidding, he doesn't do that at all. Instead, Joseph rages. He says that they are all spies and he grills them with questions about where they came from and what they're doing and why they're there. And the brothers end up telling him that there is another brother back home with their father Jacob. And Joseph tells them to prove it and then like threw all the brothers into prison except one to go get the other brother. And then he kind of has a change of heart and he decides to let more brothers go and give them grain to take to their families. But he keeps one brother hostage and he says that you must return with the youngest brother in order to have your brother back. So the brothers return home and ask Jacob so if they can take Benjamin to Egypt to Joseph. But here's the thing. Jacob wouldn't let him go. Because 
Joseph, or actually Jacob's, one of Jacob's wives only had two sons, and Joseph was the first, and Joseph was the favorite. And so later, after Joseph died, there was another son, Benjamin, and Jacob was still mourning the death of his son, Joseph, and so he would not let Benjamin out of his sight. So Jacob refuses to let Benjamin go. So they're kind of stuck. All of a sudden, pretty soon again, they run out of food, and Jacob has to make a choice. Either his whole family runs out of food and dies of starvation, or he allows Benjamin to go to Egypt to see Joseph. So it took a lot of convincing, but finally Jacob lets Benjamin go, and they arrive again in Egypt. And when they arrived, Joseph throws them this entire huge feast, and the brothers are very on edge because they think it's a setup. They feel like this is just really confusing, like Joseph threw them into prison at first, and then all of a sudden he's throwing them a feast, but one brother's still hostage, and they're confused, and they're on edge, and they don't know what to make of the situation because they feel like it's a setup, and ultimately... The brothers are right. So after they eat and have this big feast, Joseph sends them, gives them more bags of grain. But he takes his own silver cup and puts it into Benjamin's bag. Then he sends the brothers on their way, but then stops them before they get too far and accuses them of stealing from him. The brothers deny it and they're like, no, we would never do such a thing, especially after you've been so kind and generous to us. But they open the bags of grain, and sure enough, the silver cup is in Benjamin's bag. And when they see this, the brothers immediately start mourning. They're like begging Joseph and pledging that like they will all be his slaves. Just please let Benjamin go. But Joseph didn't want all the brothers. He just wanted Benjamin. But the brothers refused to abandon Benjamin because they explained that Benjamin was their father's favorite. And if he lost another son that he loved so much again, their father would surely die of devastation. And after they hear all this, Joseph is just overcome with emotion. And he finally breaks down and drops the act and admits that he is Joseph, their brother. And he hugs them and they cry and they all make up. And then Pharaoh himself actually invites Joseph's family and Jacob to move to Egypt. And he even tells Joseph to give him the best land of all of Egypt for Joseph's family to live in. And they are all together again and they survive the famine. And after a while... Jacob, the, Joseph's father Jacob, actually passes away. And after he died, Joseph's brothers become afraid of him again because they are convinced that now that Jacob has died, Joseph will now punish them for all the wrong that they've done. So they go before Joseph again and then pledge and say, look, we are your slaves. They don't think that they deserve his kindness or generosity anymore. But Joseph responds in an interesting way. He says, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Wow, what an incredible response to, he was so kind and it's so generous and I can't believe that Joseph responded in this way. So let's take a look, a closer look at it and break it down a little bit. So when you've been wronged by someone in the past, how many of you start daydreaming about how to get even? Like even if you don't tell anyone, you just start playing scenarios in your head, right? A few hands are raised. I know there's way more than you than that because I do it too sometimes because revenge can be so, so tempting. But the book of Romans tells us to never take revenge, but to leave that to the righteous anger of God. That's why Joseph responds, am I God that I can punish you? But let's be clear, Joseph had all of the resources and the power to actually punish his brothers. He even flexed it a little bit by doing some low-grade psychological torture on his brothers when they first showed up in Egypt, right? But eventually he dropped the act and took care of his family. Revenge is just not the way to go. Let's take a look at forgiveness. I recently took a class here at Hope where I learned that forgiveness is a choice that you make to let go of the past and not let it be a part of your future. It doesn't matter if that person is actually sorry or not. Forgiveness is your job and it's about your heart and letting go of the past. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He had the eyes to look back and see what God was doing in those extremely dark times of his life. 
and he chose to let go of his anger. You see, forgiveness is required of us as followers of Jesus Christ. Peter once asked Jesus how many times we actually need to forgive someone, and he thought like seven was a good number, but Jesus actually replied, no, it's 70 times seven. So for those of you doing the math, it's 490, but Jesus wasn't really saying on the 491st time you can start holding a grudge. He was just making a point that you need to forgive at all times. It isn't always easy, though, and forgiveness takes time. Even Joseph himself was mean to his brothers when he first saw them. He, it was a while before he revealed himself and forgave and showed kindness. So if you need to forgive your, somebody, just give yourself time. Work on letting go. If you get stuck and you feel like you can't move forward in forgiving someone, start praying for them. The Bible says to pray for your enemies, and it's so difficult at first, but it goes a long way in helping you let go. Once you forgive, you will be way more at peace. It is so worth it for the health of your heart and soul. Remember, forgiveness is for your benefit. Now let's take a look at restoration. In the same class where I learned about forgiveness, I also learned about restoration. So forgiveness is about letting go of the past and not letting it be a part of your present or future. Restoration is actually about allowing that person back into your present and future and saying, I'm willing to work with you on building something new. Restoration happens after time and rebuilt trust heals a relationship. Joseph said, no, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. Joseph is reassuring his brothers that they are still a part of his present and future, and he will continue to be kind to them. So I want to take a moment and let you know that forgiveness and restoration are not the same thing. They're actually very different. You don't have to restore a relationship in order to forgive. Sometimes it's actually unwise or unsafe to restore a relationship after forgiving somebody. You can forgive someone and never have to see or speak to them ever again. And that's okay. But don't leave behind everyone you need to forgive. Because God is absolutely in the business of healing things that have been broken. Joseph and his brothers had plenty of time together in Egypt to build more trust and build a new relationship. God himself even restored our relationship with him by dying on a cross to forgive us of our sins so we could be together with him again. You can miss out on so much by choosing not to restore a relationship with somebody. I have siblings and we have wronged each other plenty of times. And I am so glad that we've come together every time after a fight because they are some of my best friends now. Plus, people can surprise you if you give them more chances. Remember Judy and Gideon? See what some time and trust can do. Take a look. A dozen carrots. Thanks. Have a nice day. Come on. Hey there, Jude. Jude the dude. <laughs> Remember that one? How we doing? I'm fine. You are not fine. Your ears are droopy. Why did I think I could make a difference? Because you're a trier. That's why. You've always been a trier. Oh, I tried. And it made life so much worse for so many innocent predators. Oh, not all of them, though. Speak of the devil, right on time. Is that Gideon Gray? Yep, it sure is. We work with him now. He's our partner, and we never would have considered it had you not opened our minds. That's right. I mean, Gid's turned into one of the top pastry chefs in the tri boroughs That's... That's really cool, you guys. Gideon Gray. I'll be darned. Hey, Judy, I, I'd just like to say I'm sorry for the way I, I, I behaved in my youth. I, I had a lot of self-doubt, and it manifested itself in the form of unchecked rage and aggression. I was a major jerk. Oh, I know a thing or two about being a jerk. Anyhow, I, I brought y'all these pies. 
Gideon had some great insight there, right? Over time, he built a lot of character and worked on his flaws. If Judy and her family would have written Gideon off because he was a bully as a child, they would have missed out on an awesome partnership and friendship later in life. It can be so hard to forgive sometimes, but it is so necessary. If you're struggling to forgive someone in your life right now and you want to talk about it, please reach out to your leader or a staff member tonight, and we'd be happy to listen and to pray with you. Let's go ahead and pray right now. God, thank you for this group of eighth graders. I pray that as they go into their discussion time that you go with them. I pray that you, um, your presence just comes close to us, God, and help us to soften our hearts and forgive those who have wronged us in the past. I pray that you go with these students as they leave this place and help us to have a great rest of the week. In your name we pray, amen. Get a life.